joining us on the second day of uh, the, the symposium on spatial biodiversity science and conservation at a global scale. It was a really fun afternoon and evening yesterday. Um, and uh, um, welcome you to the second day today, where in the morning uh, we'll be focusing on uh, remote sensing and modeling biodiversity data uh, jointly with remotely sensed data, or literally just uh, think about remote derived remote sensing products that could be extremely valuable for biodiversity modeling. And uh, to cover this area, I'm, I'm really pleased to have some of the, the real experts, um, figureheads actually in this country, uh, present here today. First one of them is Woody Turner. He's uh, been helping set up the biodiversity program within NASA. He's really instrumental in supporting research, connecting biodiversity science with remote sensing data. And he'll be talking about assembling the pieces for a global biodiversity monitoring and assessment framework. For Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Walter, for setting this um, fascinating symposium up. I really enjoyed yesterday, um, learned a lot. It's a great group of folks. And um, thank you all for coming back. Uh, and for those here for, for the first time, welcome. So what I'm trying to talk about is I'm, I'm, a, I'm a program manager at NASA. I fund the use of satellite remote sensing to understand biodiversity and to try to do uh, modeling of biodiversity for applications in a program called ecological forecasting. And so I'm going to talk about remote sensing and, and how I think it's relevant or, or it feeds into understanding biodiversity at the global scale, which is the subject of the symposium. Which I have to admit, I'm still a little uncertain about how we're really going to do biodiversity globally. Um, I have my doubts. On, on, on dark days, I sometimes think it's, it's just too big of a stretch. But yesterday afternoon was really great in terms of sort of pumping me up and, and really reinforcing the fact that you know, what I've been working on and what a number of you guys have been working on for some time really is going to lead us to a capacity to understand what's happening to biodiversity globally the same way as we approach climate globally, and then to also do something about it in terms of better, better conservation. So what I'd like to talk about today from that perspective is what the pieces would be if we were to set up a global biodiversity monitoring and assessment framework, what those pieces are. And I hope I'm going to be fairly optimistic in saying I think most of the pieces are already here, that technically this is doable, um, the challenges are mostly social and cultural, and, but regardless, it's really time for us to get started. So quick outline, uh, just talk about the need. I don't think you have to spend too much time on that in this group. I am going to spend some time talking about remote sensing and how it relates to, to biodiversity, uh, which is a big leap for a lot of people. Again, based on the talks yesterday, probably not such a big leap for, for most of us, but for a, a number of folks, it's sort of the the challenge of, well, if I can't see the critters in the pixel, how good could this stuff really be, this remote sensing really be to, my, to address my problem, be it a, a, a research problem or an applications issue. So get to that. Then look at some plans that have been out in the literature in terms of bringing this together in a global framework, old and new. Then look at the pieces of that framework. Talk about parallels to climate mon monitoring and assessment, which I think you know they, they've been through this. There's some ways 20 years out in front of the biodiversity community in terms of bringing the tools together to do monitoring at a global scale and assessment. I think we can learn a lot. We have different challenges than, than the climate community does, albeit. I think it's harder to do it for biodiversity. But I still think we can learn some important lessons from them talk about some issues and challenges, and then hopefully leave you thinking, wow, that you know, we really can do this. So there was, a, there was a, another symposium a few weeks ago at the Smithsonian uh, where they were making the case that we're now in the geological age known as the Anthropocene, which is an Earth-driven planet, essentially. Um, and folks are really talking about climate change, talking about biodiversity loss. There were climatologists, there were ecologists, there were historians, there were artists. Of course, there was also a geologist there who sort of um, stood back and said, well, you know, if you think of the 4.5 billion years of, of Earth history, we're not really all that big of a deal as much as we think we are. Uh, and in terms of leaving, you know, a rock record of our impact, 
Earth is going to be pretty agnostic as to whether we were here or not, Frank. And, and so she sort of let the air, you could feel sort of the air coming out of the room, you know, I was, I'm surprised they didn't, you know, lynch her or something. But she sort of put us in that perspective. And I think, though, we all sort of came away from that feeling that, well, if we're not a geological species, then we could debate that and we want. We're at least a globally, biologically impactful species in terms of the impact we're having on living systems. I think it's, it's truly, truly global. And just to, to point out that whether you look at biodiversity and how it's changing from a species area relationship and sort of estimate from that, which is a common tool that's used to estimate biodiversity loss um, and, and anticipated biodiversity loss, or if you get down as the Living Planet Index has done and actually look at numbers of things we know, things we count, in this case vertebrates, um, both are pointing in the same direction. Biodiversity is declining and, and is likely to continue doing so. So I think we clearly have a global challenge. This is a global problem, global challenge, and therefore it demands not only local and regional responses, but a global response. And that's where I think satellite data has something to offer in that, you know, another blue marble image for you guys to enjoy, uh, a little bit later than John's from yesterday. That just to, to say that when, when NASA thinks about Earth science, when we do Earth science, we approach Earth as a planet, sort of like we do Mars or Jupiter or another body outside the solar system in terms of the whole, and trying to understand how the parts of that whole interact, the atmospheres, the oceans, the lands, solid Earth, and the biota that reside on it. And so that, that's, that's that sort of top-down approach. And frankly, you could argue that the Earth science program at NASA has really been a child of the Anthropocene. It, this image, other images that put Earth in sort of the broader context and made us appear like a relatively small, made the planet seem like a relatively small object in a pretty dark and um, large universe and thus a relatively fragile object helped drive the environmental movement that, that John spoke so eloquently about yesterday. And our funding frankly, uh, within Earth Science at NASA has been very much, a, you can, has tracked concerns about climate and other global issues. So we've gone from a relatively modest program in a, in a science program at NASA that was primarily focused on, on outer space to, I believe, the largest division in that NASA program, which, you know, again, several order of magnitudes of increase, all the cause of concerns about the Anthropocene. So we really owe our, our, our existence and prominence today to, that, to those concerns and the fact that there's this planetary view that uh, is offered. Here's another planetary view, probably more relevant for the Anthropocene nights at light. You guys have seen this. But as opposed to the blue marble, some people call this the black marble. New spacecraft up, Veers is going to be getting these data regularly. This is from a, a NOAA-generated image or mosaic from a, from a DOD satellite. But it really shows you where he, people are and their impact on the planet in terms of energy use. And that's huge. You know, where are we, where are we pulling the energy out of the system in, in, in most prominence? And, and there's, you know, you can see the planet there, dimly in spots. So I mentioned the fact that we, we look at the Earth from space. We do it in any number of different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, passive, optical, active, et cetera. We look at the oceans, we look at atmosphere, we look at land, we look at solid earth, we look at the gravity field, uh, any number of things. This is the current suite of just NASA satellites up there and operating. There are a host of others. You know, NOAA has their satellites that they operate. Um, the international community has satellites. So point here is just there's a lot of data out there, a lot of information that's now coming back uh, you know, petabytes of data on a regular basis about elements of the Earth systems. Think of it as, as the environmental data set. But what is that, you know, that's great, um, but what does biodiversity research actually have and conservation derived from that actually have to gain from these, from these looks? And how does that really relate to folks that are, that, that are worried about biodiversity loss? Can we make the connections? Well, scale is, is obviously the issue here. Satellites are good at getting out pattern. Um, not so much process, but at least getting to patterns. These are three images, uh, just varying pixel sizes. MODIS on the right here is sort of 250 to one kilometer data. That's free data. I'm going to point out cost, because cost and data access matters here. Free data for the last 10 years since its inception. Landsat, 
30 meter pixels, again, sort of an order of magnitude jump in, much higher resolution. Um, used to cost, up until just a couple of years ago, $600 a scene. 10 years or so before that, it was a couple of thousand bucks a scene. So you can see that doing global science at six, even $600 a scene is pretty prohibited. Now, what happened in the last two, two or three years, I think, that has really revolutionized things is the US Geological Survey, which operates the satellite, the Landsat satellites, NASA builds them, launch them launches them, turns them over to USGS to operate, made all of those data, both the new data and the archive, free. And that's meant you can get this 30 meter landscape scale data at no cost. And you can start assembling mosaics. I'm not, Matt's gonna talk about that, uh, Matt Hansen coming up here, I'm not gonna get into that. But you can just imagine, that has just opened the doors, kicked the doors down in terms of our ability to work at landscape scales and, and do it globally, huge. And, and of course, that wouldn't have been possible, not only data policy, but frankly, you know, Moore's Law has played a huge role here. 15, maybe even 10 years ago, even if the data were free, we couldn't have done it. I mean, an MSS scene, which was about half, you know, 80, 80 meter resolution, twice as coarse as that, you could work with one quarter of those on a computer back when I started out, not that long ago. You couldn't even do a full MSS scene at one time on your, la on your, on your there were no laptops, on your computer, your desktop. So, revolutionary right now, we're, we're at a great time. And then finally is commercial data, still costing hundreds of maybe thousand or two dollars a scene. Again, very high spatial resolution, such that you can get down to the canopies, uh, particularly in a, in a panchromatic context and identify individual trees. So you can see getting finer and finer in terms of pattern. In some cases you can derive processes directly, but mostly, mostly you have to do so indirectly. Now, when you think of biodiversity data, this is what you tend to think about uh, in terms of biodiversity observations, landscapes, uh, individual organisms from plots um, in spreadsheets or genomes or elements or barcodes, elements, molecular elements of, of genetic fragments. So we're trying to relate those pixels, those raster-based pixel data sets to these other types of data sets. And they're fundamentally different. They're point or, or polygons, vectors often, of trying to compare those to rasters. So you've got, a, you've got a conversion issue there. You've also obviously got scale issues. Um, so what can we do with that? Well, just in terms of remote sensing of biodiversity, you can sort of simply think of it as two, you know, two sort of broad-based approaches to it. Increasingly, because of high spatial, I, a la that Iconos image, and high spectral, hyperspectral resolution, where you take the electromagnetic spectrum running from, in some cases, the UV out through the visible into the near-infrared, and you parse that spectrum, not into individual bands or channels or colors, but you parse that whole spectrum into 10 nanometer fragments, very small fragments, and you project the entire spectrum. So when I say high spatial resolution, or high spectral resolution, excuse me, that's what I'm talking about. Taking the whole spectrum, the whole picture, not just discrete portions of it. So increasingly using high spatial and high spectral resolution, you can actually designate tax species down to the genus or species level with imagery. Very powerful, very cool. Not cheap necessarily to do in terms of the high spatial resolution, but, but it's doable and Google Earth has made it very popular and, and has enabled thousands of people to get their hands dirty playing with it. The other and more common approach, at least from the NASA perspective, with coarser pixel data, coarser resolution imagery, is basically to indirectly get at biodiversity or elements of biodiversity through um, proxies, such as primary productivity, climate, habitat. I pulled these three out because they're you know, something that Robert MacArthur addressed in geographical ecology back, way back in the 70s as being sort of key parameters that one would need to, to get at, to, to, get, sort of, to get to biogeographically relevant information. He threw, sort of threw productivity, climate structure out. And we can do that, I'm gonna talk about that. But I love this quote from MacArthur, I've used it before. Um, basically his point that concept of pattern or regularity is central to science. Pattern implies some sort of repetition. And if there's repetition, that means perhaps prediction is possible that having witnessed something once, we can partially predict its future course when it repeats itself. So saying that there is power in pattern in terms of getting out th through modeling the processes that underlie those, those patterns. So here's a, just an example of the high spatial. This is from Scott Bergen, Wildlife Conservation Society, who was counting elk uh, up in, in Wyoming with, uh, this is quick bird imagery, so very high resolution data, sort of down four meters and in. Uh, and he's using shadow here to actually get numbers of elk. He's done it with bison, they've done it with elephant seals. And you can tell by where certain elk are, I guess, I guess he was doing it with bison and elephant seals, 
where the males are and where the other males are and the dominance of the sub subordinates based on their positioning. And so, you know, shadows are great. And so you can actually use this to count with, he, he was getting like 90% accuracies. This is open on snow, of course. So, you know, this is not normal. But people have done with, worked with elephants in Africa, ungulates. So there are examples where you can actually do some, some interesting stuff, certain types of tree canopy, clearly. Um, now, high spectral is even, I think, more promising in terms of, this is from Phil Townsend and his group um, at Wisconsin, where they, although he may have done this back when he was at Maryland, um, but this, uh, he's looking at just two looks, one uh, Shenandoah, the other in Western Maryland out in Garrett County where he's used a spectrometer, an airborne, not satellite, this is average data, an airborne spectrometer that parses that spectrum very finely, as I mentioned to get essentially signals, reflected signals that are discrete to species. And so he's broken down different types of oaks, uh, pines, he's got some hemlock in there and some hickory where he's been able to sort of parse it out and, and ground truth and validate and have, again, fairly high accuracies in his ability to distinguish clumps of sp species within the, within, the, within the canopy using high spectral resolution. But the primary approach really is to use satellite imagery as an input to models, not to directly, but to indirectly uh, use the data to get at elements of biodiversity. And, and this, it's really important, I think, and this is a theme that will recur through the talk, the, the, the importance of place and number as being very important variables to get at for, for, for ecology. What was where and how many of them were there? This is something that's very built into human nature, I think. You know, you saw what? Okay, where was it and how many of them were there? I mean, whether you're hunting it or they're coming to hunt you or whatever, those are just, those are hardwired into our psyche. And so they sort of form the basis of a lot of, of, of ecology, frankly. So if you can get at those parameters, uh, you, can, you can get a lot. So we need models both of distribution, the where, but we also need to know abundance to really make, to have power. More on that later. And in terms of modeling, uh, we've heard a lot about this and we'll hear more. Um, I'm looking forward to Simon's talk where this is, this is very simplistic and just sort of broken it down into two broad approaches for, for modeling what I'm calling outside in, which is basically working from the environment to the organism, where you're basically using more statistical and correlative approaches. Think of habitat suitability modeling or, or traditional niche modeling in this way. There's certain advantages to that. Um, if you've got species distribution data, environmental information, you can, you can make it run. It, it gives you broad coverage taxonomically. You don't have to necessarily worry about having a lot of it, specific species information there. Um, but you, you, you lose a lot in the process in terms of the understanding of processes, understanding the physiology, understanding of interactions, the phylogeny, other things that are important. So it's, it's, it's limited, but it's, it's broadly applicable and it's easy to use and it's been very, very common. Most studies you see in the literature are still built on um, correlative modeling, outside in modeling approach. The other approach, again, simplistically thinking, speaking here, is inside out, starting with the organism itself in its own physiology, its own behavior, perhaps its own phylogeny, perhaps it's is derived from uh, from, from genetics, molecular information, to, to model out to the environment that it, can, that it can stand. I mean, this is basically getting at the processes, the why, when you really understand what the limits are on that species. And frankly, while most climate change work in terms of biodiversity has used these types of models, you really need to use these because we honestly don't know what species are able to tolerate in terms of, of temperatures, precipitation their abilities to move. So this more mechanistic ph physiological uh, approach is, is very data intensive. It's therefore hard to do uh, in many cases in terms of its data requirements, but it does get you to the why. And there's a lot of exciting work going on, um, colleagues of Simon, uh, folks here in the States about, uh, in terms of integrating these, these, what I'm again simplistically calling two approaches to modeling um, elements of biodiversity with environmental data. And then there's also population. This is a, an old, actually I pulled it off the web, it's recent, but it's, a, it's an old slide that I've updated from uh, Rasid Akakaya at um, SUNY, uh, where he's basically, his ROM SGIS approach, bringing in demographic information and demographic modeling into conjunction with landscape, more traditional landscape and environmental modeling to try to come up with a population viability analysis for, for species change over time. So you, you need the place and the, and the number. And then this is a nice paper from Dawson where he sort of, this is the big enchilada, if you will, came out. A couple, and we said, okay, in terms of trying to understand how climate is likely to impact uh, biodiversity, 
you know, you need all of this, really. You need the observations of the organisms where they are, which I'm going to argue very soon are quite limiting. You need those correlative climate envelope emission models, but you also need the physiological data. Um, you want to look at what's happened in the past. You want to bring in history. So phylogeny, paleontological data are important. Population modeling is, is also key to know, to know what is likely to happen from a PHVA context or another population context. And then you want to, you know, experimental manipulations. Well, what's, this, what's going to happen if we double CO2? What, temperature goes up, it gets this, this much drier, this much wetter. So all of these are really necessary to sort of understand in, from a climate change perspective how my taxon is likely to change. And so all of these become environmental or biodiversity records that we need to really do this job of understanding in a changing climate how biodiversity is likely to change. Uh, this is a neat paper from uh, Anu Swatantran, who's in uh, Ralph DeBaye's group at University of Maryland. Uh, and I throw it up here just to show that it sort of was a look at the importance of different types of data at getting at prevalence, in this case of migratory bird species um, in the northeastern U.S. This is from Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. They looked at nine bird species along the bottom here, black pole warbler, black-throated blue, magnolia warbler, yellow-rumped warbler, oven birds, a bunch of warblers, and then red-eyed vireo, dark-eyed vireo, and the yellow-bellied flycatcher in terms of their, or dark-eyed junco, excuse me, yellow-bellied flycatcher. In terms of the, um, the prevalence of these birds, and they were trying to characterize Using a, using a random forest, a correlative model, is, is in terms of, and, and for the environmental data, they were after both um, essentially Landsat textural data from, from NDVI, from taking two bands of Landsat and combining them, as well as structural data that they got from a laser, a LIDAR, two actually different types of LIDARs, I won't go into that, but two types of LIDARs, discrete and waveform, and a radar. They, those were all airborne data sets with the exception of the Landsat. And, so it term, and then they took things away to say, okay, what, what it gives you the most power? To make it short, the LIDAR proved to have the most power, the structural information. When you're getting down to a small, relatively small area like Hubbard Brook, this isn't continental, so scale matters here, by the way. If you were doing this continental, then maybe the NDVI, the Landsat, would be a more, a, a, a more powerful tool. But when you're getting on to, down to close to the site level, structure, as MacArthur theorized, is quite important. And so that LIDAR had the most power, the Landsat NDVI second, and then the radar, which is, again, gets you to structure, but radar's funky. The backscatter is affected by water and it requires a lot more interpretation, whereas the LIDAR is a much more direct. It's basically a laser, it's blue, li I'm sorry, it's, it's green light or red light, bounce down, coming through the canopy, you know, hitting everything, boom, 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 coming back to the surface and bouncing back, and you're reading that backscatter. So you get essentially a direct look of what's, where the lights are and where the lights aren't and where the structure of the foliage is from that. So that structure is really, is really powerful. Um, and then this is another, this is sort of, again, uh, Greg Asner's work uh, from the Carnegie Airborne Observatory in uh, Peru, Brazil, and Amazon uh, in South America. And this is sort of taking it to the next step. Again, this is airborne data. He's, what he's done is he's outfitted, and this is the, basically the NEON model that he's, he's following, but he developed it and has been applying it in the tropics, where he's got a LIDAR, again, the laser, downward looking, bouncing off vegetation, going all the way to the surface and coming back. And then he's got a spectrometer, not just the Landsat multispectral, you know, seven, eight bands chopped up the spectrum into these little chunks, but he's got the whole spectrum going from, you know, almost from the UV, from the very beginning of the visible, out through the near infrared. Okay, it's one continuous spectrum, one big wave. And so he's looking at that, and what he's finding is that the reflectance that you get from the spectrometer is affected, no big surprise here, by the biochemistry of the plant, and that that biochemistry also has, a ta has taxonomic relationships. So he's been assembling very large libraries. This is an, obviously a very complex area, maybe the most complex area you can think of. It's sort of Amazon Andes, right there at the, at the, at the transition zone. And, and he's been able to relate reflectances to biochemistry to taxa. And, so he, and then also throwing in the structural data gives him that, that that 3D, that niche component. So he's sort of got the whole enchilada in terms of ecosystem composition from the spectrum, structure from the LIDAR, and then the functional aspects, which are also spectrally and somewhat structurally derived, okay, so the biogeochemistry. So it's a nice combination, and here he's sort of colored different trees, different colors, and you've got the structure feel, so there's a depth there. 
And this is an airplane. So, you know, you, you fly it back and you fly it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You take a lot of data, but it's just, it's, you can only do so much with a plane. And so the dream is to get these suckers in space to where you've got a spectrometer up there orbiting. This, would, this is a, a, a plan for a 60 meters pixel spectrometer from the, from the running from the UV at 380 nanometers up to 2,500 nanometers and a thermal multispectral sensor on it on, called HISPRI, which I've been working on a bit. And then an ISAT, which, uh, which is a LIDAR built to look at ice, but it also has vegetation components as the earlier one has demonstrated. This is a new technology. Hopefully photon counting will work as well as the old technology. We'll see. There's some skepticism out there, but we'll, we'll figure it out. But anyway, my point in showing these is just to say new satellites hopefully can bring these two approaches together, structure and function composition, into a global ability at fairly high, fairly high relatively high spatial resolution to get at some of these parameters. But it, you're still going to have to model most things, and so we also need a capability to, I should have started my whole talk with this point, and that is that, you know, if I had to have a one-word title, it would be integration. I didn't say that, but it's, that's, that's true. Uh, our our three-word integration is imperative, would be the, sort of the three-word title for this, for this talk. And by that I mean, you know, integration across scales, across disciplines, across communities, um, in this case, across modeling types. So interoperability is key. This is something Gary Geller out of the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena has put together. It's something he's been working on for a couple of years. He calls it the model web. And his, his concept is to try to make outputs of models act as web services and so that one model's output can be the inputs to another via the web and it's fairly easy to actually integrate models. You've got aggregation of error issues there, obviously, but nonetheless, at least you've got model talking to model and so here's something that he, de he derived wor uh, working with you know, the folks out at NASA Ames where you've got global climate data and local climate or regional climate data feeding a biogeochemical bio cycling model which can feed fire models or land cover models which in turn can, can provide inputs to more of the correlative type niche model and get at species distribution all to answer a big question like as the climate changes can rare species X still exist within my protected area and, 2057. So to try to get at these, it, it, so it's really about pulling models together and developing a capability for interoperable modeling. This is an actual example of such from, from Francisco Chavez at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, um, one of our investigators where, frankly, the oceanographers, I think, are ahead in this game relative to terrestrial people. In some ways, they've had, they, they have in some ways less data, so they've had, they've been more challenged. And, and they've been, I think, more aggressive about this. What's running down here at the bottom is, oops, is a, which I just stopped is a regional, go, yeah, a regional Pacific Basin-wide uh, ocean model, a ROM, and I believe that's, I think that's temperature, not height. I believe that's sea surface temperature that's running there. Anyway, that physical ocean model generates uh, 12 and a half kilometer outputs for the entire basin. They feed, from the physical model, you basically feed biogeochemical models that uh, Fei Chai, University of Maine has developed called COSINE, which links biogeochemistry to life through phytoplankton, basically through a trophic model. So you go from biogeochemistry, these outputs here, to uh, small and larger uh, phytoplankton, the base of the food chain in the ocean, and then try to, and this is the big trick, going from phyto to zooplankton is the really hard thing to do, uh, the grazers. But they've, they've, they've added in zooplankton to this model, and, it, and it's working well enough. This, this, the use here was to try to come up with a forecasting tool for Chinook salmon in the central California system. You know, we know what happens to them better anyway, what happens to them on the terrestrial part of their life cycle, but when they get in the ocean, it's sort of a black box. What's affecting them in the ocean in terms of the re return of those salmon to, to actually spawn? This is an attempt to get at that, and they've, they've issued, I think, nine month uh, forecast now, nine months in advance forecast of, of whether it's gonna be a good, bad salmon year uh, coming up based on this, this integrated model. And he got, Francisco's Peruvian, so he got started working in Peru, world's largest fishery, Anchoveta down there. The Peruvians have an incredibly well monitored boats, helic planes. So, so it was a great data set to start with, and now he's working with, with something off the U.S. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this one because time is, is tight, but wanted to get to a paper that to me was sort of a big deal. I don't know how big a deal it was for a lot of folks. This is Pereira and Cooper's paper in Tree in 2006. 
And what got me so excited about it, I think a lot of people are so excited, particularly in the geo context I'll talk about a little bit, is that it's, it was one of the first papers to really integrate remote sensing and, and large scale global and regional biodiversity um, accounting systems, if you will, or measuring systems into one common framework. So he sort of, he has basically, he called here for essentially two strands, if you will, an environmental strand, which was fed by remote sensing and, and ground-based information uh, on the environment, and a biodiversity strand, which was fed by global assessments. So what Gerardo and others were talking about in terms of mammal assessment, amphibian assessment, assessments of birds, uh, driven by red list uh, tools, by the Living Planet Index, Again, these global indices, handful that exist out there, as well as regional efforts like the breeding bird surveys in the US and the UK and, and other efforts to essentially come up with these parallel lines of data that would um, provide a way to monitor biodiversity from the top down, do it globally, which, you know, at the time I was like, that's what I'd wanted to do, but I didn't really know, you know, I hadn't sort of put it all together, and this paper was really neat in doing that. It's, 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 it's a little dated now, but it's still worth checking out. And he even came up with sort of a political framework. This is the really hardest part, guys, down here at the bottom. You know, how does this actually work from a policy standpoint? Who's going to pay for this? What's, what's the political framework, the national framework in which it exists? He pointed out the group on Earth Observations, more on that later, as, as being a, a group to, to bring this out. Here's a schematic that sort of shows these lines spatially, global programs and regional programs, and then breaking out between environmental and uh, biodiversity along the bottom. And this, this paper came out around the time that GEO was getting started. So in terms of the organization of GEO Bond, the GEO Biodiversity Observation Network, we'll talk about that in a minute, this, was, this paper was sort of a very instrumental, and Enrique has been on the steering committee of that group, so it's, been, it's, had, a, it's had a sort of disproportionate impact, I'd say, on that group's thinking. Um, and now we saw a lot of slides on, from, from Walter yesterday on this, but one way to look at, at the map of life, there, there are a lot of ways to approach it, but one way to, to approach it is in sort of this context of global frameworks for understanding biodiversity and how it's changing, bringing together these different types of data sets and um, integrating models. In some ways, this is, a, this is a more sophisticated version of what Enrique and David were doing back in 2006. Um, both in terms of the, the data sets, the observations suite involved, uh, as well as the ability to integrate those data through models and essentially bioinformatics tools and, and the web, citizen science tools, into a, into a holistic approach. Um, which I, you know, when I, again, when I read um, Walter and Yana and, and Rob's paper, I, you know, again, it was sort of that, wow, this is it, it's coming together, I can sort of see it. It's a nice, nice road map here. There, there are pieces that are discrete and identifiable, and we can, we can go from there. Um, this, this, of course, focuses on species distribution. It doesn't get to that abundance issue we talked about earlier, but it, it, it's, it's a start, and that's, you know, we can bring those data in. I was really, Steve's talk at, about eBird yesterday and, and a couple others where people are actually getting abundance data. Those data are gold. You know, the how many, that LPI, another you know, great data set in terms of getting it number, that's gold, and we can now, and you can bring that into the system, I think, quite, quite readily. So maybe this is uh, Enrique and Pereira 2.0 or something. Um, and in this slide, what I'm trying to do is just say, why would we even, assuming we can do all this, would we, why go global? Um, from a couple of perspectives, both the user of the, I'm sorry, the producer of the data and the, um, the user of the data, just list these out quickly that you can, you can read them. I don't want necessarily go through them due to time, but you can get a sense here of, of what we get, the bang for the buck that we get by going global. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a fairly compelling case, both from the, the producer side, the data provider side, as well as the consumer side, the data user. Saw this slide yesterday, and the, the take home message that that I take from this is that, you know, there's some quite robust data sets on the environmental side, many satellite-based, not all, some model-based, but that biodiversity data in general are limiting, but in particular what's important are time series of biodiversity data. We need those time series. Uh, we need to get observations up, but we need time series. Without the time series, doing predictive science is going to be very, very difficult. The good news in terms of biodiversity observations is that there, as you all well know, new sources of data out there. 
in terms of uh, getting at in situ data at the organismal level, camera traps. Light's important, but so is sound. Lots of things happen at night when we can't see it with light. And so capturing things uh, sonically are, is extremely important and the tools there are even perhaps more powerful. And the fact that you, know, you can do a Shazam with your cell phone in a, you know, in a store and you hear a song and it's like, what's that song? I don't know, well, you know, if you hold your phone up and it can identify the song and, and sell it to you is extremely useful in terms of, you think bird calls, insects, every, a number of things. So we're getting more sophisticated. I know it's a jump from, you know, Skinner to, the, to Drosophila, but it's, it's still, it's, it's doable. Um, and so in terms of just what do we need to do, bringing these pieces together, um, there are a number of existing uh, tools out there and data sets that uh, we've heard a lot about. The key is to organize them. Um, this would be the expert base piece, both in terms, I'm talking all the way from genetics data to organismal data, the assessments, um, bird survey data, as well as networks. Down here, I want to really highlight plot networks, the SIGO group, the team activity, and a number of others that are generating plot data. It's, it's key to integrate these, these, these plot efforts, these networks. They don't all have to be measuring the same thing in the same way. But at some level, they need to be integrated so that we can call their products off the top and pump up the number of biodiversity observations, particularly biodiversity time series that are being developed. So the challenge there is to sort of bring a framework in which all of these players can start working together to make their observations available. And then going beyond the experts to the volunteers, the interested public who may well be expert in their own right, to bring in citizen science as a, as a way to really inflate those observations. Heard a lot about it yesterday, don't need to spend much time on that. I will point to another Enrique Pereira piece in Frontiers just a couple of years back where he estimated that for about 50K a year, uh, we could have groups of experts and volunteers focusing on a selected taxa, terrestrial vertebrates, butterflies, and key plants uh, in regions of developing regions of the world. And it would be, you know, for that, we could generate the data we would need to outfit a, a biodiversity monitoring system. And so, do we have the pieces? Um, here's, here's the list of what I think are necessary, the, the, big, the big five, if you will, rated in order of whether we have it or not, how easy it is, to, whether, whether it's successful, and um, starting from one with we, what we've gotten to, what we don't have. So those are, the, those are the big ones. Satellite data, time series observations of biodiversity, interoperable frameworks of models um, to develop a predictive science, bioinformatics cyber infrastructure, and then the most difficult and challenging is sort of the institutional framework to make it all, to make them play together. I think GEO, Group on Earth Observations, is, is such a framework. And GEOBON in particular as an element of it is key. I think Walter may, not Walter, but um, Simon might mention that in his talk. No, I, don't, I, I thought you were initially, so I didn't go into much detail. But uh, yeah, we each thought the other was doing it. But it is, it is an international framework based at the governmental level uh, with international organizations that is about, about coordinating observations. One of its elements is biodiversity, and one of its key products is GeoBond. So there is, I think, a political framework to fit this within. Looking at climate, this is a, this is a possible model for us to follow. You've got the different elements here, research, assessment, policy, and observations for the climate community, what, which has been quite successful in terms of getting observations to assessments, uh, at least to an international policy framework, how successful they've been in implementing the policy, we can argue. But nonetheless, there is a framework out there that they feed. And so this is, this is something that we could emulate. They've come up with essential climate variables that they think are necessary to measure for time for, for long term. Um, here's a biodiversity look at that globally. The pieces again that uh, in, with the formation of IPBES just in the last year, I think are all there. Uh, we Geobon is trying to set up something called essential biodiversity variables. I think these will be key long term records, analogous to ECVs, essential climate variables that we can use to feed our, our modeling systems. And then we're also fortunate, almost done. Sorry, Walter, I'm going long here. Um, within the US, there's a comparable framework that since the PCAS report, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology came out with this report about a year and a half ago, that we've now, we're setting up sort of a parallel framework within the US of uh, observations, assessments, and policy that um, could mirror what's happening at the global scale. So again, timing is on our side. 
and I think this is my next to last chart, just some of the issues and challenges. I'm going to hit these in turn just because I think they are so important. Open data policies are critical. If the data aren't available, preferably at no cost, this doesn't work. Um, we have to actually link people from the communities. It's not enough for, for the biodiversity community to try to do this, or certainly for the remote sensing community to try to do this on its own. They really need to be jointly linked. Um, Cal Valor is critical. Uh, we got to, we've got to validate the data we have, organize the site networks, then choose taxa that, that uh, to start. It's going to be hard to choose the taxa, but it's, I think it's going to be de facto taking advantage of the taxa that were already being observed. Enable model interoperability. Move out on all of these fronts at once in terms of observations, modeling, assessments. You need a sampling scheme to put these all in. Governments should be involved, and GEO may offer, I think it does offer the way forward here. Use the web and, and engage citizens. Um, and then finally, my dad's mantra, you know, mistakes are okay, don't be afraid to screw up. So go ahead and start. And this is the final slide, it just shows the, the, the workshop that Walter put together for us, which I think he was quite, quite brilliant actually. If you look at the, the folks that are here, not so much the people, but also who, what they represent, you've really got the components of the framework. Uh, the pieces are there in terms of uh, biodiversity observation networks, citizen science groups, um, some remote sensing elements we're going to hear more about soon, modeling efforts, we're also going to hear a lot more about that soon. The, the data and integration piece is challenging, bringing in the marine realms, putting it in the broader context of climate change. So it's a, it's a great uh, symposium. Thanks for organizing it and sorry I was so verbo verbose. Cheers.